So good morning, everyone. And uh, today is the second day of our workshop. And uh, we're going to focus on the stats. And uh, 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 afternoon, we're going to be on metab analyst. So metab analyst mainly is a kind of a statistical and functional analysis. And a lot of the statistical concepts is built on uh, this morning's uh, lecture. So uh, if you have questions, not quite sure what, uh, what it's about, just raise your hand. And I would like to go to details. In the past years, is that um, sometimes we go to uh, very low, sometimes very high. So we try to adjust. As Anne just mentioned, we are not going to go to very details on t-test and the distribution. So we slightly go to more machine learning, and hopefully will be better received this year. And so yesterday, we mainly focused on this uh, um, uh, analytical part and the different uh, uh, instrument and collecting the spectra and use different databases to try to identify and quantify them. And from that, uh, uh, we uh, get a list of metabolites or a table of metabolites with their uh, concentrations. If you're doing untargeted, you probably just get a list of the uh, peak and uh, um, identified by their retention time or the mass and the peak intensity, which is usually the standard output from XMS online. And today, we actually want to show you how what's the uh, uh, method to actually go from this uh, um, uh, peak list, from this compound uh, concentration table, to go to uh, their significant uh, features, pathways, and functions. And uh, uh, this is a... Uh, uh, um, overall kind of concept is that uh, we can use stats like multivariate statistics on the top uh, left uh, on the top right is uh, basically um, chemical metrics PCL PLSDA and uh, lower bottom shows uh, our seeker basically help you to identify uh, robust biomarkers and uh, performance evaluation and then on back end is uh, basically shows uh, uh, all the CAG pathways basically you can map there and do analysis on there and uh, visually explore it and this all going to be covered uh, today. And uh, uh, metabolomics basically uh, is a relatively new field, and it's uh, follow all this kind of standard or approved practice from atomics field, ma mainly from the, like microarray or transcriptomics, because it's metab uh, you can think about metabolite concentration is like a gene expression. It's uh, the high and the low corresponding to a lot of the uh, same biological uh, regulated by the same biological process. Actually, when we go to analysis, we can find a lot of things that's common, but there's also some unique uh, method that's uh, more specific to uh, metabolomics. And uh, while we don't talk about uh, t-test, uh, uh, spend too much time on t-test, we need to talk about the uh, uh, different approach or the p uh, ideas behind the p-values and how do we uh, do some test even the um, distribution is not normally distribu uh, is not normal, and this is a very important concept in a lot of the you know, complex data where uh, we don't know their distribution. And the other one is very common. Actually, this is very specific for metabolomics: is uh, um, multivariate stats like PCL PSDA. And uh, this method is not usually used that wide in, uh, in gene expression uh, data analysis. And uh, the slightly more expanded uh, mo uh, module today uh, for this year is that uh, uh, machine learning concepts. Basically, how do we tell which one is doing a good job and what's the pitfalls and what is clustering? So, so this is uh, um, a lot of people actually asking, hey, uh, what uh, is uh, statistics? How it, how is it different from uh, what's statistics versus bioinformatics versus machine, machine learning versus uh, artificial intelligence. This is quite quite a fuzzy concept, and there's a lot of progress in recent years. And uh, um, and uh, disregarding uh, how people think the similar or dissimilar, the mainstream actually, uh, there's some people in the practice identify them as machine learning or bioinformatics or stats. There's some overlap. You can see it here. And the machine learning is more like from computer science and the statistical is more concerned with uh, hypothesis testing and parameter estimation. It's more traditional. But now they are more merging into data science. And uh, uh, machine learning and stats became more uh, fuzzy in between. 
and there's common things we can see during the clustering and classification and regression analysis. So a lot of uh, stats use machine learning um, to evaluate the performance and machine learning uses stats to uh, estimate parameters. So it's uh, it's become more blurred, it's a good thing. And the other thing I'm not going to talk is artificial intelligence, which is uh, concerned deep, deep learning and it's very hot area and it's, uh, you should uh, attend a different workshop if you are interested in that. So again, if you have questions, you can raise your hand, okay? And uh, here is a general workflow in omics analysis. So this is, uh, you should uh, gradually build a, a, a workflow or concept in your mind. Disregard metabolomics or in the future, you're probably going to do rn seq analysis. It's the same thing, same high level uh, uh, steps. Uh, so uh, rn seq basically you need to get the count table and metabolomics, you need to get a really feature table. This feature table could be pick, uh, uh, peak or compound, compound concentrations. And after you get your data, what you need to do first step is a quality check. If the data looks normal, is that uh, something fishy or outlier stuff? You need to really, before you spend a month is analyzing your data, you need to really make sure the data is, seems okay and deserve your time. So how do you do that? Is there's no, just one button and tell your data is okay. Is that you need to, uh, consider the experiment design and uh, visualize your data and use some common approaches like uh, like box plot overall and there's a scale plot there's different uh, even heat maps the different things help you um, summarize the data looks at the data from different perspectives to uh, uh, to make sure this uh, mm, they are okay uh, of course you have more experience this uh, process can be shorter you can just spend one hour and think this data is fine for other People start learning, you probably spend more time. And uh, if data is fine, you need to uh, usually need to normalize the data Norm uh, because omics data is really multi dimensional, it means the features, uh, some like uh, some metabolized concentration are very high, some is very, very low. And uh, if you direct compare them, it's become very hard, not comparable. And the small changes uh, in uh, like glucose can have like hundreds of uh, macromolar, but in others, more. Uh, low concentration metabolites. It's just a few uh, very low level of variance. So if, but they are not, uh, they don't mean they are less important. So we need to usually normalize them too. So the comparison will be more or less um, equal and you can really find more significant, uh, less biased. Directly compare, uh, disregarding the, the concentrations or variances, usually uh, it's not that powerful. You, yes, you can think about it's more like unparametric uh, test. So unless your data really, really robust, have very strong signals, and you probably miss too much. So data normalization is very, very important. And the last one is uh, statisticals and machine learning. So if uh, you really your data good quality, data properly normalized, and uh, then you can really explore all the possible possible approaches from the. You really used to start from simple and see. Um, there's some interesting patterns, then you graduate go to more advanced. Uh, you, you don't go to the other way. If you go to more advanced, go to simple. This is usually, uh, our mind don't work this way. You gradually build up hypothesis, see if it's confirmed in another method. And this is, a, um, start from your comfortable method, gradually expand and learn. That's so uh, keeping your mind, input, output, this is also today for our uh, lab is that uh, it's not a spectra, uh, even it, it could be, uh, but uh, uh, spectra processing is very specialized task. We need to uh, uh, respect what uh, other tools like MZMind, XMS, and they are doing a very good job. And uh, if you use a target, you're really manually doing this uh, uh, spiking and doping and quantify, so that's um, a lot of work and uh, I don't think uh, automatically can give you really uh, uh, good quality input data. So the data is supposed to be like an Excel uh, spreadsheet, like a matrix, and it's with the numerical values, like um, uh, concentrations and peak intensities. And uh, the other uh, thing that yesterday you realize is uh, um, it's metadata. Basically, we want to know the class labels, especially we want to do some uh, coloring. I want to control it in red and the uh, uh, disease in the uh, uh, blue or whatever color. 
the program need to know there's a different label associated with that. So you need to give them metadata so they can do t-test also on these two groups. So indicating what's your samples of interest. The output is uh, basically uh, the first one's uh, what's significant, like uh, uh, what significant features and uh, uh, compounds. The other one is that uh, sometimes you even don't see significant, that, but you see overall interesting patterns. So you can see the PCA uh, or heat map, you see some pa patterns. So um, t-test or significant testing is not the final, it's actually one part. The other one is clustering, also very important. Even if you don't have significant genes, you can still see good patterns and for you to develop your hypothesis. The other one is uh, uh, rules, if, uh, if you really use classification, sometimes you can see which compound associated with these uh, uh, outcomes and uh, you can develop some hypothesis and models. So uh, we, um, these models, if you're doing that like a regression or a logistic regression models and you can actually see how they interact. So this is uh, uh, actually became less commonly used in omics because the models became more and more complex and it, it's hard to develop some um, uh, gut feelings about this model. So the models like uh, the one most commonly, more, more powerful ones, like uh, SVM, random forest, is usually is a black box, and you have to treat them, and if you trust them, and it's hard to interpret internal working on that models, but they are still very valid, robust models. Okay. So for the data ty types, I hope most of you are very familiar. So we have X and Y. Basically, uh, uh, we're talking about the data is your X and your data label is Y, is metadata. And uh, so uh, for, uh, for our data, we mainly it's a continuous data because there's concentration. And for RNA-seq data, you, it's count. Count is an integer. It is a discrete. So you just think about it. Uh, stats treat them very differently. Discrete and continuous is very uh, using different models. So regarding to Y, basically uh, the metadata, uh, uh, most robust, easy part is binary, basically yes or no, uh, one or zero disease control, and uh, uh, the other one is just the ABC or nominal. The other part is called ordinal. Ordinal is the uh, uh, last one. It is uh, said it's, uh, mm, ordinal means some order is meaningful. So uh, this one is uh, like a time series, those response. So sometimes it's uh, 10, 20 or 100, so there's uh, some orders inside. When you do analysis, you actually want this order to be uh, recognized, to be used in modeling. This is uh, less common when uh, when I started like uh, 10 years ago now, uh, people are talking about personal ma personalized medicine or precision medicine. They want to collect data based on their, for each person follow different days, so time point uh, or the dose became more uh, important. So, uh, uh, so this is not a uh, Okay, folks, today, but in some method, in metabolic actually starting respecting order. So uh, when we do demo, I'll just show you some of the parties that you need to be careful uh, which one to select. And uh, here is that uh, I already said about this. So um, uh, uh, different uh, uh, discrete and continuous are different. And uh, um, you can see this is uh, continuous because you have fractions. You see this is constitutions, and this is discrete because it's all integers. It's a count. How many times you see these genes, uh, or these reads, been uh, occurred in your sequencing? So this is, uh, uh, if you're talking about st st stats and the two very general things that said normal distribution, this is for uh, this continuous. Uh, Poisson distribution is usually for this uh, uh, count. So this is a uh, uh, different school uh, in stats. And again, um, I just covered this. Just keep in mind there's such such things, and uh, in stats actually uh, it's different, treated differently. And uh, some, of course, some of the method can uh, consider order, but a lot of method like ANOVA they, they probably don't uh, don't take even you give that they probably don't uh, actually cannot handle it. And uh, mm, uh, this is a, a PSDA actually is a. Uh, in the recent metabolist, they have this uh, kind of uh, class order matters. Uh, class order does not matter. Uh, basically, this is going to be this is going to be ordinal. This is a, if you have a time series, 
and you really want to respect all the one, two, three, four, and you should uh, keep it cha changed. If you don't, this is going to be treated as a as a um, A B C D. There's no particular order. The thing with this is that uh, uh, people uh, from users uh, uh, says that uh, if this change a label, their group pattern is different. It, it, this is if especially if you're talking about this uh, uh, ordered. If you use ordered and change the label, and it's, you can switch your order, so the result will look different. But if you switch using this one, uh, just all the data matter, they will, they will still keep the same. So this is something uh, when we do our lab, we'll discuss about uh, these options. And uh, this is relatively new. And uh, 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 this is uh, about uh, common terms. I know a lot of you already know, and we just quickly go through. Univariate is that one variable, or one feature um, at a time. Basically, we're talking about alanine across all the samples. That's alanine unit, just one variable. By variables, uh, uh, we can talk about alanine versus creatinine. This is two variables. Multivariables, more than two. Okay? Uh, dimension of data is the basic number of the variables. So gene expression for humans is 22,000. If, if for the metabolites, we usually get to thousands or hundreds, hundreds or thousands of dimension, so it's a much lower uh, dimension at the moment. And uh, we already talking about uh, uh, how to read in data and stuff, and uh, if I, I guess actually that's the most the tricky part, but once you understand what the input required, what the uh, labels it uh, looking for, you, you should be able to quickly use your Excel to prepare such things. And uh, next one we are going to visualize your data, and uh, what's the, how do you visualize your data? And sometimes you see it's very simple, and uh, but it's very helpful. And uh, there's no magic bullet in visualizing multi-omics data and it give you a whole picture. So you have to try. And uh, starting from basics is, is that uh, uh, we cannot see all the data. We can look at a summary of data. What's the center? Basically, the mean and the media and the mode. The other ones, how they're spreading out. and. Uh, um, so the, the normal distribution is the best. We have a lot of models. We can summarize with just a, a simple uh, value, like mean or standard deviation, uh, this one. But when you have the data distributed like a uniform form, it's very hard because uh, you don't see a strong convergence or anywhere. You have to actually treat all of them. So you, if you summarize this one as a mean or median, it's not informative because you're not, they are not standard at the mean, even you can calculate the mean. And this is extreme uh, distribution, and uh, it's it's uh, uh, so it's really interesting to see your data and uh, choose um, a proper um, approach to summarize them. Some of them is not even summarizable. For data like this, even you're doing PCA, you you can see everywhere and no patterns. Okay. And uh, relative standing, basically the distribution, you can see the quantiles range and the IQR is interquantile range. Basically, I'm going to here and uh, the box plot. So uh, I get emails, people asking box plot. I'm just sending email, did you Google it? Because it's top. And uh, I can explain through my email, but uh, Google gives you much better Wikipedia. But anyway, we go through it. You, 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 you. Assume this uh, relatively normal distributed data is uh, actually very nice. You can see send this is the median, this is the interquantile range. Basically, if you divide, rank all the uh, uh, concentrations from the uh, high to low, and you can divide this top 25 and uh, 75 to 15, and 15 to 25, and 25 to 0. And this is basically the focus, and assume majority information is there, and it focus on that. A lot of time we just use mean or median to represent the whole data to do the modeling, because we cannot take all of them. So if your data have followed this nice distribution, and it's very a lot of metabol um, a lot of stats going to working well. But if you just like previous, if you really distribute it everywhere, then that's going to be hard. That's, um, and uh, we, 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 a lot of time we just use average to, to as a representing, uh, like group average. We don't look at each individual sample. We use group, group, group average for the concentrations, or use, we ignore the variance. But the variance is very, very important. And uh, we assume they have the more or less equal variance, but a lot of time it could not be true, and uh, it's, it's very hard. So the smaller variance is much better. You can see that even the same. Uh, same mean, but if the variance is uh, 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 smaller, you can see you have more confidence. These two different uh, 
s much significant because they don't overlap. But you you see that same distance between mean but variance is higher, and you can see that uh, overlap is a lot. So variance is also very important. So I, I hope by this time you should really have the concept that uh, because um, we cannot uh, consider all the data points simultaneously. We use summary stats, basically mean, to do the calculation. So we really choose a center here. So if uh, uh, so if the, your data is really centered around me, it's very dense here, and we really choose a very good data point or value to represent your data. So if your data is spreading very large, like this, spreading everywhere, you still choose a center point, like uh, use a mean to represent it. It's not going to work well, because uh, just because you can see overlap is a lot. And you just use one value, and this is the part we are going to not working well. But if you like this, you choose one value re represent the whole thing, it's going to be separating very well, and it's very representative of your data. Okay? Whole idea is to summarize your data, use one or two values, and use that one to do the computing. Okay? So normal distribution, and we're going to quickly go through, and uh, a lot of why we're interested in that, because it's uh, uh, well accepted, uh, actually, in both biological and physical measurement, they seem all normally distributed. And uh, some of them already figured out the, all the uh, complex stats behind it, and the computing actually doing normal distribution so fast. And anything else became much slower to, compared to normal. So, uh, so because of this convenience, we really want our data to be normally distributed. Okay? Most time it is. And sometimes it is not, and so uh, we need to do some tricks to get it normal. And uh, so this is a uh, this is a scary things, and I hope most of you are already quite familiar. You see this one, but you don't need to remember because it's all built in the computer. They take care of that. And uh, uh, so um, a lot of times we see uh, actually uh, metabolomics. We see data looks like this. Okay. This is not normal, but it's closed. So we can apply like a log or stuff. It's became very normal. And this is less common if you have a population actually very um, divergent. And sometimes you see this, and uh, it's uh, it's hard to normalize this type of data. And uh, and this, this one also quite common. Skewed the metabolomics, raw metabolomics uh, data. Sometimes you can see uh, this side is all low, and high is become less common. So. Uh, uh, Data normalization is the whole idea is that because all the statistical model uh, work on a summary summary number. Okay, that summary number is like most like a mean or average. So, which works best if it's normally distributed? If it's any other things will, will not working well. So just for this reason, we need to normalize the data so the stats will working best. Okay, if yeah, uh, this is the main motivation. Uh, stats working best means the p value is more accurate and the conclusion is more robust. Okay? We have to please the statistical uh, method and uh, re respect what the rules. And uh, So here is a skewed distribution. And we just uh, uh, it's exponential. And we're doing log transformation. And it, now it's become perfect normal. So it, it will be easy. And uh, yes? Um, when you do a log transformation on your data, yeah. Like to report your results, like for example, if you'd like to report the standard deviation or standard error, do you do this reporting on the original data, the one before transformation or after transformation? Oh, you're talking about uh, within the tools or meta analyst? Yeah. Oh, you upload your data, you have your copy called original data, and your filtering data as a second step called process the data. The third one, normalized data. So you have three copies in that tool. In theory, every step you should have a copy, but in that going to create a lot of the, save a lot of data in copies of data. You are going to confuse. So every step actually being recorded. So you have a normalized data, original data, and processed data. Yeah. And you give all these parameters for each set of data? Yes, have named by that. And also the each step, so what parameter you chose uh, to normalize the data will be there. And you're going to have an analysis report and t tell you exactly what they have done. So this is real data from metabolomics. And you can see it's a skewed distribution. A lot of them is very close to uh, zero. And uh, um, 
abnormalization, you, you can see they shifted to the right and more normally distributed. So one thing I keep in mind is that uh, normal apply log, and you're going to exaggerate some very uh, small values. So a small value means uh, uh, like close to zero. If the low close to zero actually is low quality, you actually you actually ex um, how to say you enlarge the noise. Okay, uh, pay attention. Log is log transformation is not uh, a magic. Things. If you, all your data is a high quality and you can apply uh, apply log, it's no problem. But if you really actually close to zero, this kind of thing is uh, is uh, low quality. Uh, you you're not quite sure. Apply log, you give them more weight compared to high ones, and uh, this could be the side effect. Okay, this is um, uh, log is not uh, the but the good thing with log is that uh, log is easy to um, uh, kind of understand, and there's more fancy approaches. And this is uh, uh, published 2006, but it's cited widely. And uh, why is because uh, uh, it's it's important, but it's also boring. People uh, people don't research on it a lot. So this person actually try the best and evaluate all the possibles and give some. Guidelines. There's no golden rules, so you have to do this and go do that. But it do um, give you some ideas about what's the advantage, or what's the limitations of certain uh, cer certain approaches. So um, the title is uh, "Centering, Scaling, and Transformation." And all, you can read this paper. Okay, it's very educational, but I'm not going through details. It's just too long. And uh, yeah, um, actually, I read this paper and. Yeah. I'm interested in the Pareto scaling because yeah. it says that it reduces the effect of the high concentration metabolite. Yeah. Would that be acceptable approach in order to make the comparison between high and low concentration met metabolites more fair? Or should I just do my analysis in two separate steps, one for the high concentration and one for no. the low? You, I don't suggest that you do it in separate steps. Yeah, I, I, you basically. It's all married in one go, and you should do it. And a lot of times, uh, uh, your um, your your equipment have certain detection limit above that, and it's just working well. It's not because you're high, less thousands, you're going to marry the uh, more accurate than one hundred. It's all working fine. If you became a point point zero, like micromolar, and then became the same, but once above certain uh, threshold. And machine became accurate. You should trust that. You shouldn't discriminate because high and low. Uh, I, I think it's artificial. You create some division and uh, causing troubles. Future, we're already doing some multi-omics integration. You are talking about even within metabolomics. You want to divide it, divide that. It's uh, uh, method-wise. I really think it's introduced more <laughs> work. And regarding Pareto, is what this uh, person or whoever his uh, group probably some relation. He is slightly. Advocate for this approach within metabolites. Of course, you have the Pareto scaling. We are actually the first one to uh, put it there. But in reality, is that uh, I don't find it uh, much better. I would uh, advocate just to, uh, if your data uh, like uh, doing targeted metabolomics, all the measurement seems fine. Just doing log, it's easier to do uh, to try. You compare log with Pareto, see what's the difference. So um, this I don't strongly advocate uh, any method, including Pareto or whatever. Probability quotient normalization, but I do uh, suggest this: uh, your data quality need to be uh, double checked. It's good. Then second one, start from simple ones. Simple is easy to interpret and see the result, the patterns, whether it's uh, uh, fit some of your biological sense, uh, your gut feelings, and then gradually increase the complexity. Don't just uh, uh, precondition. I only use this because this paper saying this. Your data is different. It's really uh, case by case. Okay. Yes, here it actually shows all this method there, and the potentially we can add in three or five more based on user request, and uh, but enough enough, and we we probably adding gradually adding one or more, uh, one or two. So uh, the data normalization at first is uh, like a sample normalization, or bi biological normalization, because you can have the different uh, uh, um, dilution, for example, dilution effect in your sample, like urine samples, and you have tissues. Or the volumes difference, so you can normalize by the sum or median that's per sample specific, and you can do the transformation like a log or, or 
uh, cube root, somebody just uh, really strong said it's very good, so I put it there. I, I personally, I, I be honest, I never use this. I only try log, and like uh, below this one also looking fine. Pareto auto scaling uh, mean centering. So uh, uh, and uh, of course, and uh, people you can do it here like uh, uh, normalized by the median, uh, normalized by the reference sample. If you really your uh, um, your sample is some is more like a reference standard. Uh, and you use that, it's going to change your result dramatically. Median, also the same thing. So uh, so the first one, biological uh, things, really is based on your design and what do you think. And it could have a very dramatic effect on your result. Okay, We can discuss later if you have an interesting result on that. Mm. If you, your samples are all good quality and uh, uh, no particular uh, reasons, you just use it like just the first one I should try I suggest just use log only, don't even use scaling, because much less procedures applied, it's much easier to go, oh, this concentration means like this, you can go in back, think about the reality. Once you apply a change of calculations on your data, you cannot just walk in back and think about, oh, this actually increase this amount and cause this one, it's become so complicated. So starting from simple and gradually increase uh, uh, more steps. Yes? Uh, yeah. Sometimes they hard to normalize it after you apply everything, and I, I, you know, I know I read something that they, they kind of uh, divide it to groups because sometimes it becomes like the data is from the male and the data is from the female, and they couldn't because they, they had to really normalize it all. So they divide the, the sample into groups, in gender, and uh, analyze it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it the best way or what is that? Yeah. Uh, if <laughs> That's a good, good question. If your data actually truly by model, and what you have done is right, because uh, we assume all the samples from the same population, we just sample it. This is our assumption. If you really you can see that's two population in your data, the best way is model separately, do the uh, separately. In the, in the case, actually, you can upload your data, labeling with different, uh, like, uh, Gender has uh, things, and to see whether their gender cause some issues, then you should, if it's really gender, have a different distribution, you should analyze male one, or, uh, and, and female uh, uh, separately. This is really, they're talking about two populations. And stats is always talking about one population. If you don't compare, merge two populations together, right? I don't, uh, I don't think uh, you should try your best to, if by model, try to normalize in one model. It's, it's, it's just uh, you hide the truth, and the truth is two populations and two models, and do it separately. The only downtime is, do you have enough replicates? Uh, and is for example, male or female, do they have the equal or relatively balanced design of treatment control? You can do that analysis. If you have very small samples, you just have no confidence, right? So, good question. And now we're going to the last step is this and stats and machine learning. And probably it's going to cost a, a lot of the a long time. And uh, the first two steps is, uh, is relatively simple, but uh, it's very important, okay? Uh, if you're not doing it properly, you're going to have troubles in uh, here. So whatever conclusion, probably not that robust. So understand p-values. So everybody think they understand, and I think every time I'm... Yeah? Yeah, Pre data normalization, yeah, in meta analysis, usually bring something like before normalization and after normalization. Yeah. Then, yeah, yeah, you, you do have. Uh, below there is going to a graphic output that ask you, allow you to see it. I just uh, show the options, and when we do the lab, you will see that. Yeah, basically, visually, you can actually explore whether it seems better. Okay. Um, but uh, be careful. Uh, yeah? Um, yeah, just another question about this one is how to deal with data below the limit. Yeah, that's a good call. <laughs> How much trust do you give to it? If uh, it is a lot, like 35%, uh, um, uh, I'm just from, it's all below detection. And uh, you can try to, I don't know, replace with a very small, smallest value if it's really below, to go through it. If it's more than half, and just remove it. I'm thinking about uh, uh, that's, um, you couldn't do too much. So you can use, uh, uh, in meta analyst, and uh, we usually replace by half of the lowest value. So your decan limit is like 0 
and uh, then that missing value or you just don't detect it, I give the point zero zero something, and so you can still calculate, but that doesn't really um, discard your data. So um, stats and p-values. So what I'm saying that p-value is imp important. Actually, p-value is just a, uh, every time I'm reading it, I also feel I'm le learning deeper. So I, I think just uh, let's go through it together and see what p-value actually about. So here is the population, and with stats is all about uh, population. So you sample it and uh, come up with some summary like mean, and standard deviation, and uh, you want to infer the whole uh, population probably behave like this. And this is a um, whole stats uh, try to, to model population. So it's really based on your sample. If your sample is biased, and you're probably not going to have a very accurate estimation. And here we assume that this is the whole distribution, and you sample it here, uh, this area. And now you get this mean and standard deviation like this is more reflect the overall population, but just somehow for some reason you sample in this area, and you get get the a mean is slightly shifted here. It's not go to population and the variance very large. So you're not really you, of course you have these estimations, uh, but it's it's not uh, as reflect very close at the population. So uh, we talk about sampling bias. So in this case you have actually. Uh, bias and uh, the confidence not that high, but still if this is your data, you have no clue about uh, uh, how y your estimation is close to the population, okay? This is uh, traditional and uh, how, how we marry this uncertainties and there's uh, p-values. So this is uh, how it comes. So we don't know uh, what's the uh, population and we don't know what's the truth and, uh, um, and uh, uh, Instead, we use p-value to indicate our levels of certainty that our result represent a genuine effect in the whole population. Okay. So p-value is the probability that observed result was obtained by chance. So uh, if you see such a result and uh, just a random, there's no real effect. Or what's the chance you can see such things? You have your model and uh, you can compute in what's the chance, especially for normal distribution. Actually, a lot of people can do the calculation in your mind. I couldn't, but because I'm using R, I can always get ask R to tell me. So, uh, for example, 0.05, this is all normal distribution. If its chance is very low, we think it's, it's not random. Actually, a real effect. So we reject the null hypothesis. So if the p-value is uh, it's slightly, the chance is slightly high, you think, oh, it could be random. We are not quite sure. So you don't not reject the, the, the null hypothesis. It's not saying that the the, it's not if the p value is not significant. It's not. It's just that you don't reject an null hypothesis. It's not saying your treatment don't have effect. The, if you increase the sample size or have a better experimental design, and probably you'll be able to de detect the effect size. So what it says, the p value just tell you it can don't have sufficient evidence. Okay, uh, this is a, uh, it's not a, for decision making, and you really think need to think more on that. Calculating p-values is uh, actually easy for normal distribution, and you can see uh, if your observation is within certain range, and you can see that what's the probabilities. Uh, of course, you if you this is the population your model, and what you observe is five here, you can be very significant, no problem. And you can see if you a lot of your observation here, you can see actually it's totally different population, and this this population, this is become by model almost, if you have a lot of observation there. So it's you're going to have very, very significant. And uh, yeah, and uh, we're talking about uh, the ideal world is normally distributed. And uh, in a lot of cases, we don't know. And uh, actual review don't, don't, don't think it's normally distributed. So how do you convince the review? Say, hey, this is a very robust conclusion. And uh, we have p-value very significant based normal distribution. and. Uh, it's hard to believe that the whole omics data very complex, like say metabolomics, target on target different platforms, and normally distributed. It's most time if you view it, it's not. And how do you do that uh, very robustly? Is calculate empirical p-values. Empirical p-value 
it's uh, become very very common and nowadays in the big data because when we talk about big data it's uh, very complex and most time it's not normal and uh, we have powerful computing we can actually de novo calculate p-values okay um, just be comfortable with it and try to understand as much as possible because uh, it's going to be became very common so it's used that we don't know the distribution and we don't believe it's normally distributed and uh, uh, how do we find? And we need to compute the now distribution. Basically, there's no effect. What it is random, and how uh, how many times we observe such things. Okay, this is the whole thing. And basic principle is uh, on the now hypothesis. Basically, there's no effect. Okay, uh, you basically uh, all your class label doesn't mean anything. Okay, you can sh you can think about your male, female, or tr treatment on or or, or, or control that make any cause any de defect. In this case, all the sample is mixed and randomized. Now you calculate what you're going to observe, uh, like uh, uh, mean, uh, mean difference of like or fold change. And uh, basically, you, you can do it multi-time, multi, multi, multi time, like a million times. And uh, you compare with the one with original one, with your class label and the original design, because you believe there's an effect. How many times the effect you observed uh, um, from this randomly shuffled data is more significant than your original data, okay? If, if that time happens quite often, and you cannot believe that the effect in your data you observe the real is caused by that, because the, even random can get, get a better result, right? So, but if, if the random shuffle never generated data as good as yours, even in one million times that random permutation, and you should be very, very confident. So you, what's your p-value? P-value is less than one out of one million times, right? This is called empirical p-values. So empirical p-value is never going to be zero because you, you, in that you have to do the permutation infinity. You cannot do it. So 1,000 times, never get better. Use less than 1, 000, one out of 1,000, OK? So I guess the principle is, should be very clear because we have powerful computings. We just cannot, we just cannot, we just can't do the simulation or permutation. And if you write a code, and uh, I'm just going through this, if you want to write code, this is how, <laughs> How you're going to do it, but most time this kind of built in metabolic a lot of the tools. So how can I do it? Use a very simple, uh, simple example is that uh, uh, we have just one it's a student test score. Okay, I have one group. Uh, let's think about student. One group of case, one group of control. Okay, we are not talking about metabolomics. Or we can think about just one very compound concentration. In this one is like this, and this one like this. The mean difference is 0.54. One. So is that significant or not? You're not sure, of course. And how do we do that? We assume there's no difference. If there's no difference, we can shuffle them. So, so we can shuffle. If you compare to the previous to the next, you can see 1 to 9 is all belong to case. And 10 to 18 belong to control. This is original, OK? Let's assume it doesn't, all this label doesn't make sense. Now we just shuffle put it in a case, uh, randomly draw from the over all 20, okay, you can get 9, 3, some is still the same case, some are already shuffled from the other one. So this is the same thing. And we do the difference. This is point three two nine. okay? That's, and you can just shuffle them, just shuffle them. Uh, and you repeat one thousand times, right? And uh, you can see this is your originally observed difference. And this is all your shuffled data. If the case and control label, the original doesn't mean anything. There's no effect. And this all, it's all here. Now, at this time, you should be very confident that uh, there's a difference between your case and the control. Right? And uh, um, if there are three times the permuted data has given a larger difference, and p value going to 0 0.03. So out of 1,000 times, there's three times, uh, it's better. So this p value is 0.03. So if it never, so it's p less than 0.03, but it's not equal to zero. Sometimes people adding one or stuff, just uh, this is all fine. So it's all standard. So oh, in the past, it seems to be very challenging for people to understand. But uh, if you don't, I, I'm happy to try my best to go to, from the other ways. Or you think it's very easy? And that's, that's good? OK. So general advantage is that uh, does not rely on any distribution 
assumptions, so it's not necessarily to need to be normal, and the corrects for hidden correlation. Because a lot of times your data have some certain hidden structures we don't know, and uh, uh, it's very complex. If you're doing a permutation within the same data, and the, the thing is still kept, so randomization will also address that. So it seems uh, quite robust. Disadvantage, computationally intensive, especially for large data, but on the other hand, how many possible permutation you can do? I mean, if you have only three and three, and how many population uh, permutation you can do? Uh, I, I'm not good at math, probably 20 or 30 times. You cannot get a very significant p-value because you're going to exhaust uh, uh, quickly. And so uh, for a good permutation, have uh, like uh, 1,000 times, I think at least uh, uh, 12, 12, or 10, 10, at least uh, think about that. So uh, it's just a, a permutation is a randomly draw. If, if you have very small sample, if a random draw, we'll quickly repeat uh, some cases you did before. So here is another important uh, concept. I'm moving to another. Um, OK, we already. Uh, went over the uh, p-values and empirical p-values. That's a very important concept. I hope you guys accept. And the second one is the multi-testing uh, uh, issues. So for most of you, probably it's already common. And so I'm going to go over it qu quickly. Yes? Uh, so why would you not always use empirical values? Oh, because it's not powerful. If you if you really follow follow a normal distribution, use p values. You can get uh, use it in uh, normal distribution. The p value going to be significant. If you're doing the same thing, uh, uh, doing it, it's it's not as significant as at one. As, uh, permutation also cause some also has some var variations. Sometimes you're doing this permutation multi times, you don't get the same result. So it's uh, need to be uh, yeah. Uh, we don't have a universally bad method to replace the normal distribution, okay? Uh, it's a hypothesis testing. So <clears throat> so um, this is already uh, we covered briefly on the p-value calculation. So how likely result if we're going to get it from the sample if now hypothesis is true, okay? This is a p-value uh, calculation. So uh, this is standard approach from a very conventional uh, statistics. And we already covered that, and uh, we're doing this. Uh, in order to do that, we need to compute the p-values. And um, we have some arbitrary cutoffs, like 0 0.05, 0 0.01, if we normally distribute it. And um, issue here is that uh, uh, all this one is based on the uh, univariate, basically one variable at a time. And if we're willing to accept, like, uh, uh, Mm. There's a small chance we see that it's random per variable, but metabolomics or gene expression, we have hundreds or thousands of the variables, so it's accumulating. So at this time, if we're ta talking about uh, uh, 10,000 uh, hypothesis testing, uh, and uh, by that one, we're going to have 500 is significant just uh, by chance. So uh, this is uh, um, issues, so we need to address and uh, how do we do that? Is that um, traditional is about bound around your corrections. So basically, we just really become very stringent and divided by the number of tests, uh, divided by the number of testing. So if uh, 0.05, you really divide by n, now it became very, very strict. So that could make cause you have no signal in the, uh, genes or metabolites to work on later, So which is not uh, ideal. So you always want to. Because that means it's a death sentence. You can have nothing to work on later. So it's become very strict. It's, and people found it's not uh, reasonable. Uh, and my idea about the stats is you should help support uh, people developing a hypothesis to reduce, narrow down the, uh, the search space so they can have a more focused hypothesis to develop new experiment rather than just give them data. And so Stats should not dictate uh, biological research, so um, that they need to be something else. So there's something else like uh, more like more common ones: the false discovery rate (FDR), and uh, uh, it is more lenient. So it's, for example, if five percent means if you select five uh, one hundred significant compounds out of one hundred, five of them going to be 
false positive, which is okay because you're doing omics analysis, 5% is totally fine. So because you really need to do like a qPCR or you're doing some validation, so even 5%, so all this is going to be addressed. It's the omics test, the omics experiment usually is a start and um, it's not the end. So validation is going to be followed. So you have a slightly lenient uh, um, cutoff at the beginning. It's actually, it's very uh, conductive for your later research. So, high dimensional data, and uh, we uh, have uh, metabolomics. And so far, we mainly discuss about uh, uh, that all this concept is mainly for a single variable. And uh, like T test ANOVA, I know m most of them. Uh, I still try to use this uh, at the beginning uh, as a first try, which is, should be. I mean, uh, SE mostly well accepted, and uh, <laughs> and the common approach is that uh, uh, if you have your metabolomic data or atomics data, and uh, if you have sufficient replication, uh, you should have try your t-test, ANOVA, and uh, you apply them single uh, ver uh, this st statistics then and. Uh, across all your variables and uh, visual, uh, you can visualize and uh, you can you can try to do something this is uh, uh, this is all okay you should really try the fr at the beginning because uh, directly go to this uh, more advanced is uh, <coughs> for me is I'm slightly against you should try to explore individually especially you have a lot to understand this compound supposed to be high here if this one is true and you have high Confidence on your data, okay. <coughs> and once you once you've done this, now you move to the high, more advanced uh, um, stats. It's uh, multivariate, and multivariate is basically um, try to summarize your data to a, a low level, so you can still explore, visualize, and uh, this is a. Uh, so for example, here it shows that uh, we cannot directly view our data in a high dimension, and this is a normal distribution in one dimension, this two dimension, this is three dimension, four dimension is going to be hard. Uh, actually, yeah, I'm, I think about uh, 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 so multivariate statistics. Uh, multivariate. Uh, this means uh, you consider multiple variables simultaneously. Okay, uh, this is not one at a time across all the variables. So simultaneously, that define it. Uh, uh, it is usually more complex, and uh, it's um, so the reality is that uh, most of us been trained or, or uh, been taught about this uh, um, univariate, and uh, because. All these kind of uh, stats concepts they divide like Fisher exact test, even t test, or last century. Okay, at the time they don't have this uh, omics data show up, so it's um, they developed that very well accepted, well established, and now we need to um, consider more than that because you direct apply that. We already see there's multi testing issues, also modeling because if you have very low number of replicates, but you have a lot of measurement. And one uh, one issue ca caused by is called n uh, uh, much far less than p. So n is that uh, your number of replicates, p is number of the variables. Basically, it's uh, very hard for any program to model it because this is just uh, the reality. So how do we do that? And uh, uh, stats uh, actually almost gave up because uh, all the Theories I mentioned the developed early last century is dealing with low dimensional data, and uh, they cannot address omics data, and uh, even they address it's just not satisfactory because you can bump around, you apply all this stringent, and uh, does not consider all the variables simultaneously. So what do you need to do, and computer science come to help. Actually, computer science is very open minded, and. Uh, yeah, at at the time I'm I'm I frustrated with stats uh, quite a lot. I just attending all these kind of the class asking this uh, question. They they look at me and think that I'm kind of doesn't make any sense. But come on, I'm working in the omics. It's a real data, real uh, challenge. Why don't they address it? 
So then I went to a computer science and took all the classes, and they are very open-minded and try try the best to do it. So it's it's graduate now. It's not stats, not computer science, become more data science. And uh, but uh, the two approaches like here is that uh, uh, clustering and classification. Okay, regression is more uh, stats part. So this is very helpful. So. Uh, uh, omics data have developed beyond the scope of classical stats, and it borrow a lot of strengths from uh, from like uh, machine learning uh, field, uh, like image processing and uh, uh, camel magics. So um, the one particular thing that's a dimension reduction and machine learning, machine learning clustering, like uh, actual PCA. Also, you can think about it's a clustering approach. Okay, and uh, uh, before we really jump into machine learning. And uh, uh, have a, I just put it in your mind some overall con things are called unsupervised and supervised. Uh, and if one not here, this is new. It's the supervised learning. Is that new to anyone? Do you? Oh, it's all fine? I'm just, uh, I'm not going into details because I assume this is very basic. So unsupervised. Uh, Basically, don't consider the class labels to whatever based on data itself. Supervise the you need to do the modeling with regard to the class label, okay? And I'm not going to cover too much details. So, how do we help understand the large, high dimensional data? So, one is clustering. So, this is a, it's a close your mind, a close your eyes, think about it, because data is so high dimensional, like 20,000 features. How can Make it more understandable. One is that I put the features that are more similar to each other, put them in small, in a different beings, like like 100 beings, and uh, based on their similarity to each other. Now you can reduce uh, 20,000 to 100 beings, so each being is represented by their average. So this is clustering basically reduce the number of things in uh, to consider. And as long as that uh, each being representing the data uh, well, it's it's fine. And uh, dimension reduction is actually is try to reduce high dimension data into low dimension, and how they try to do is they try to reduce the summarize the variance. Yeah. When you try to uh, cluster similar pieces, is is clustering between the pieces or between the samples? So you do you cluster the samples with similar pieces or do you cluster the pieces? Yeah, it's a good question. So he's asking that uh, when I'm doing clustering, it's applied to the sample, of cl uh, applied to the features. So um, usually, um, uh, of course, we can apply to both. Uh, in, in, uh, in R or in where, it's just a block of data. You can transpose, rotate, so any direct doesn't matter. But for us, is that we already discussed that, that high dimension talking about the variables, uh, it means you apply to the features in de by default. Okay, if you really want to see which sample is more similar to each other, you should uh, apply to the samples. But uh, mainly, we apply to the features. We want to see which features are close to each other, so we can organize these features. See, these uh, 12 compounds are more similar to each other because uh, it's most likely uh, involved in the same pathways. We are looking at uh, uh, this understanding of the data. Okay, this is default. But you can always do that different ways. It's all, uh, mm, uh, the algorithm is really agnostic to whatever your uh, direction you apply. So, uh, if, so now if we talk about the, put the samples of features into similar the beings that's, uh, who is more similar to each, each other, but how do we marry the similarity, right? This is, a, um, this is important. So uh, if, if we want to do the clustering, so we need to marry the similarity, we need to add a certain threshold, we said, okay, you are similar enough to put in the same being. And uh, now same being, then after we organize like uh, from 10,000 to 100 beings and to 100 beings, how to raise similar to each other. So each being also need to marry to uh, how similar to each other. So we, we, can, we want to uh, respect the data as much as possible, uh, but we also want to summarize them. So this you can really see is that uh, it's nothing fancy, it's just practical. We really want to reduce the data, but still representing the real data, okay? But it's more digestible understandable smaller size, okay? So the clustering is basically doing this, and there are some fancy terms called the key means. Uh, they belong to a, 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 
a category called a partitioning method. So they, they want to do is divide this object into an M cluster, basically M beans, with or without overlap. It's based on the and hierarchy clustering. They don't actually um, give a particular cluster, but they just from the top to the bottom, from bottom to top. So it's up to you to visually check and and set a threshold where to cut off. And the K-mean is very well used in machine learning, but for biologists, people want to do the hierarchical clustering because they don't have any clue about how many clusters we are looking for. In the end, they say, show me all the possible things, and I'm going to decide. So hierarchical clustering is very commonly used, and uh, especially for biologists who actually knows their data, they can see uh, at where it makes a cut of small biological meaningful. So uh, K-mean clustering and uh, um, I'm not sure how, how, how many of you want to know more details because this is a, a very basic building. And so uh, a lot of randomness. So you, you throw your object uh, there and, uh, and then just go to next and see where they close to each other and put them together and recalculate the new centroid and move just back and forth. Let's go here. And uh, so you, you have your data, assume it's two-dimensional data. Uh, uh, just uh, data here, and uh, you want to have them like uh, two groups. Uh, uh, so let's see A, B. So uh, you don't know where it's located. Just give them two random seeds. You can be located anywhere. Then ever who <coughs> close to it is going to be re re recorded as, uh, 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 for example, two seeds red and blue. So you just record it red and blue. And who close to them just color that this. Then you recalculate re the new center, and uh, recalculate the new center and move there and redo the whole process. Eventually, it's going to converge. And once you're just going through back and forth several times, you're going to converge. So if you have a strong pattern disregarding how many different seeds, you're going to converge to the nice separation like that. But in a lot of cases, there's some. Um, uh, Fuzzy, so you have different start points. Sometimes you you end up in some uh, class and slightly different, which is uh, also quite common. Unless you have the nice data like this, so guaranteed you're going to separate like this. Sometimes it's there's a fuzzy decision depending on the initial state position, and something can be changed. But uh, this is also expected. So uh, in computing, you can do it very fast and easy. Okay, K mean is. Uh, uh, Quite quite popular. You can a lot of actually online decision or customer profiling in a lot of things. It can easily bring you into different uh, categories and give you some suggestions. You should do, buy this. You do that because you can using K mean and uh, all your shopping or the buying habit can be actually easily do it at real time. And uh, <clears throat> hierarchical clustering. So um, this is more commonly used in biology uh, by biological researchers. So we found an uh, object very close to each other. So we, we, here we see two objects. Can be your features, can be samples, and uh, actually in reality apply to both. If you do a hierarchical clustering, apply to both sample and the feature, you can see a dendrogram is on both sides. Okay? <clears throat> so you merge them and uh, repeat the whole process and uh, uh, like a uh, uh, this is also like uh, k-means, but you don't need to specify the initial seed position. It's just starting from the either highest level to lowest level and uh, working uh, start working. So uh, uh, key parameters: similarity between the samples, similarity between the clusters. So uh, I think uh, based on the question, it shouldn't be similarity between the samples, similarity between the features. So because you can cluster across the, the variables. Okay. So uh, I think that's. Um, you should understand that. So we're just doing a calculation and merging them and recalculating back. So unless you are uh, going to write a code yourself, I'm not going to details, and uh, because it's all been done in the program. So similarity error, and uh, why would we need to care about? Because uh, this parameter has been exposed to you in the type analyst, and if you uh, <coughs> you need to make an informed choice. Like uh, most commonly used, the uh, similarity mirror is uh, in Euclidean distance. So uh, this is easy. Basically, you just do this. Uh, mm, uh, each corresponding uh, features, just uh, the conditional difference. You just uh, uh, difference and the square and uh, doing this, uh, uh, add it up, then take uh, uh, take the root. Uh, so it's uh, 
common. It's, it's uh, like uh, our physical distance in the space. And uh, the other one, simulator mirror, is a uh, uh, <coughs> uh, Pearson correlation. So it's uh, normalized, so it's uh, divided by that. So if your data is already auto-scaled, so Pearson and uh, Euclidean will be the same because you have unit one. So it divided by one is still the same thing. <coughs> so uh, Pearson correlation is that uh, you have this uh, <coughs> difference here is that you have directions. You can see it in the top because it's not a, a squared, it, uh, uh, it uh, can contain the negative. So you can see the uh, uh, positive correlated at 1 and negative correlated minus 1, okay? <coughs> so this is a 1, this is a minus 1. So this is, a, a, you, you can see this uh, um, Questions? No? It's all you remove the PCR physics, uh, uh, higher, higher correlation to the data? Uh, can you repeat? Why, why we do that uh, in the similarity case? Do we remove those PCR physics that they similar to for analysis? No, no, no. This is actually your part of your, uh, you already normalize your data. You are, you are analyzing the data right now. Doing a PC, doing this stuff is actually used in a <coughs> heat map clustering. You actually see the patterns and which groups of features are close to each other. This is, you are actually analyzing data right now. Uh, just uh, like uh, using, I'm talking about different parameters. Uh, when you see the heat map, hey, which parameter I should choose, right? Oh. Yeah. So clustering is basically you need to uh, uh, several things are called a single linkage. This is the closest data point, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, generate long chains. If you sometimes you can see a heat map uh, with clustering, you can see, huh, this is using a, a single linkage because it's some very high, uh, uh, very long, uh, I don't know, lag, lags or long chains, and this is a complete linkage. It's actually quite commonly used. It's the furthest data point. And they have the clumps. It's very shallow, and this is the average. It's a more or less comfortable. Seems, uh, and so you can see that uh, this is from very typical. Probably first uh, heat map being used. So you can see uh, this is on, only applied to the uh, variables, to the genes. You can see this is a uh, um, up, down regulated, up regulated, and it's nicely separated, and uh, from the top to the bottom. So, uh, so anyone, if you have difficulties understanding hierarchical clustering and we can definitely discuss up to in the lab so I'm not going to too much details which uh, it's okay. okay so hierarchical clustering is very um, natural or intuitive and uh, uh, PCA uh, is uh, also supposed to be very intuitive in um, your metabolomics but it's less so if you're from RNA or gene expression, and uh, but uh, uh, I I try I'm I'm working in both field. I found the PCA just most time done working well in the uh, uh, gene expression. It's just uh, but in metabolomics working very well. It's uh, it's just an interesting observation to see that uh, different uh, systems. So what PCA try to do is project high dimensional data into low dimensions and keep most variance. And here. They think the variance of data is a key information. So if keep as much as possible, that means more uh, uh, high fidelity to your data. And here's that uh, um, a commonly used uh, things to think about PCA is that uh, what's your data characteristics? And uh, here's when, because we can only view in 3D. So here's a three-dimensional <coughs> bagel, and you, 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 you project in two dimensions. And uh, there's an O shape, there's a hot dog shape, and uh, and you need to choose one. So the O shape is more, yeah, if you need to sacrifice something and you're going to keep the O shape, it's more informative instead of the uh, hot dog because that's uh, that seems to be more characteristics of your data. So the PC is actually commonly used for image analysis, and people were actually found to identify the face that's representing the characteristics of your. Uh, facial spec, uh, uh, features to rec facial recognition. So it's uh, borrowed from machine learning and they've been refined. And uh, 
for PCA, we are not only for the visual representation. A lot of time, we want to see which features actually contribute to the separation. And so we not only see the pattern, we only want to see the which compound actually drive the separation. Uh, and so that's, that's I'm giving you some scary uh, slides. You see that uh, how the principal component being computed is that uh, it's actually a linear uh, uh, combination of all your original features but multiplied by a weight. So the P is a, is a, is a, is a weight. So it's, if we, in the PCA plot, they call it the loading. So you can see this is original data, this is your weight. So the, uh, uh, the sign, positive or negative of the weight, or the value, basically, how big is the weight, actually have, make a, that's, that, this one, this P value actually contribute to, um, um, oh, here. So this P value, the sign and the, and the magnitude of the absolute value of this way actually contributed a lot to the separation. So uh, how you rank your important features by rank by the signs by the absolute value. So of course the bigger that value uh, contributed more to the final score. So this T is your final score going to show up on the map. But who is contributing more? So it's the, because the X is your original data. It is, it is here that actually have more influence. So this, this is bigger. It more or less have more influence, okay? If you go under the hood and see what's going on. <clears throat> so uh, this is actually how the, from original to the new dimensions and they rank them based on the, <clears throat> uh, based on the variable explained because we are lo only looking for the um, uh, most uh, variable. So like say top two, and it's hope to explain at least half of the variance in your data. And the more detailed the PCA is that uh, once you uh, extract uh, the one component that's uh, explain most variance, and now you're going to uh, attract, uh, extract the second one. And uh, the condition that the first one and the second one is unrelated, so, uh, so this is orthogonal, they call it. And so um, uh, this one's maximize the uh, uh, make it easier to interpret. Some of the uh, approaches that make a good separation, but there's some, some overlaps, it's not orthogonal. So uh, there's, some, uh, there's some more uh, complex approaches, but not necessarily make it easier for you to interpret your data. Um, <clears throat> but PCA is, it seems to be a standard, and uh, if it's working well, and really you should try to use it, because uh, uh, easy to interpret, also this is unsupervised, it's based on your data. So if your data already is separated well in the PCA, you you really just think about uh, biological story and based on PCA probably plus some ANOVA or t-test, you can write your paper. You don't need to do more analysis if the PCA already show the difference. Okay. So the other part is that uh, uh, PCA is a rotated uh, axis. Basically, if you need two D, and uh, uh, and they just uh, create the axis, uh, just like uh, from the current ones actually move to the one. Uh, red and green, okay? It just basically makes sure uh, the first axis, like X, is following the most data variance. In this case, it's almost a diagonal, and the other is orthogonal, okay? It's, uh, PCA can be interpreted different ways, but uh, just uh, you need to be comfortable. You can choose any one you, uh, you, you like. <coughs> so PCA can be operated on two different things. One is called variance matrix, the other one is correlation matrix. So, uh, Covariance is that um, I'm not sure I should go too much details because uh, if you normalize your data, it's auto scaling. So covariance and correlation will be the same thing because all you need one. And um, <clears throat> if you didn't don't do normal scaling, the covariance is going to be uh, uh, more influenced by the one is more abundant. Okay, more abundant change like um, glucose is very abundant. The change of that is going to ca cause a huge variance change out of the global all your data because that's a very abundant things. If you auto scale it, you're going to each one contribute equally almost. So this is up to... So when the usage of the covariance matrix will be relevant? <laughs> it's a, it's, I know you're going to ask that and uh, I don't know the um, kind of the uh, co co covariance. It's as long as the, you see, if you really think that the most abundant uh, uh, constant compound it's going to have their changes. 
it's very important compared to the one less abundant, then you just choose the covariant. If you really think that uh, uh, 20, 20 micromolar versus 5,000 micromolar, it's just, this is alanine, like this is uh, glucose, but as long as they married accurately, they change, twofold change, more or less the same uh, or similar. You should try to reduce the, change, um, the covariance driven by the high abundant ones, right? Otherwise, it's, it's, you always see these guys and they overshadow the other small compounds, right? Sometimes people actually remove the glucose, remove the urea to, to, because they know the interest in some less abundant ones. So again, this is up to you how you think and how you want to modify it. And uh, I would like to come up with some clear-cut rules and build it into a metabolism. You click button to get a result, but uh, that's not good because people want to explore, people want to learn. And uh, once everything being wrapped in a box and you just click and believe me, and this became not found in research. I, I'm just, uh, so th there's no clear cut rules. You have to use your brain and uh, try to convince the reviewers, right? So why, why the use of metabolomics uh, uh, is, uh, and we talk about this PCA and uh, this, this is PCA like this, you be, should be very happy. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, initially it's an MR, this is an MR spectra. It's a three different patient and the control and it BAP. So, and uh, I think it's one of our first uh, studies. And when you bin this spectra and uh, just do PC, it's, wow, perfect separation. It's basically very hard. In, yeah. in these cases, PCA can be used as a clustering method because in textbooks they don't mention that PCA is a clustering method. Yeah, I, I believe you can be. Cluster method, you have an explicit, like a similarity mirror between a sample between clusters. We discuss about this. PCA get actually their main purpose reduce dimension. You can see their computer reduce dimension. But in the end, they actually cluster. It's, you can see that on, the, on this figure. Uh, things that are close to each other are more similar to each other. It's definitely clustering. But uh, their primary goal is reduce dimension. Uh, so Yeah, but if I interpret this in the paper, that uh, no problem. I have yeah. clustering, so it is clustering. Yeah, it's it's acceptable. I uh, actually when I put it as chemo matrix or clustering, I'm just back and forth. It's it's uh, it's. Uh, yeah. So here is a hidden uh, loading plot. I mentioned about all this kind of um, co co correlation coefficient when you're doing the loading, how you calculate it. So this is a kind of pe people don't like it, but when when you see that the signs or magnitude. So if you have more uh, big values, absolute big values, you go more close to the corners, up and down. And these ones tend to have this uh, um, more influence. And the signs, basically, you drive in this word, uh, this direction or this direction, okay? The good thing with PC is that uh, this is always uh, correlated. So, so if here uh, and here, uh, let's just focus on this control, okay? So the here, this group of things, we are going to have very positive correlation with samples in the control group, okay? And uh, we can see the here, uh, the group of compounds here, we are going to have a negative correlation with, uh, with that control, okay? This is a very intuitive interpretation. You can just walk through that um, math in your mind, you'll find out it's just, uh, it's not a coincidence, it's just a very nice feature to, there. Yeah, it's exactly, if you put PCA side by side, you can see this uh, a green and this uh, kind of the minerals is uh, correlated positively and negative correlated here. So separation here and versus these two groups, separation here for these two groups. So this is PCA, that's why people like it. You don't understand, but visually you honest, actually find it's very pleasing and you can uh, do it. So in some cases, PCA will not succeed in identifying any clear clustering, uh, no matter how many components are used. And, uh, and uh, in this case, it's wise to accept the result, assume that uh, uh, you cannot distinguish. And uh, actually, it is so true. A lot of times, if you, your data is high quality and everything is OK, if you go to PCA, you see uh, you don't see a strong pattern. And uh, it's very rare, even if you use more advanced, they're going to give you a very good uh, result. Um, 
So this is a PC actually. When you see the PC, you actually already have a. You should have certain uh, feelings about what result you're going to see. At PC is a, a very strong overlap, and you get some like a PLSDA later. You find a good separation. You're so happy when to publish. Most likely it's called overfit. Basically, the pattern is not robust, and you're not quite sure that pattern you see is is uh, real or not. Okay. We are going to talk about PLSDA later. And uh, questions? No. PC very good. Data overview, outlier detection, and look at the relation between different variables. So, <clears throat> really, you should uh, use PCA uh, with other uh, like box plus stuff as your quality control, as whatever your first lines of weapons to 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 understand your data. So PSDA is this is also a sibling of PCA and P, people don't like to use PCA direct go to PSDA and it's t tell me a good uh, separation which is uh, wrong I can tell you I just uh, don't do that do PCA first a direct go to PSDA is really dangerous and uh, <clears throat> why PCA PSDA is really good is that PSDA is supervised they try to maximize the covariance between the data axis and the class label uh, supervised always uh, uh, see this last one PCA always produce certain separations with regard to the condition. It always try to please you, make you feel happy. Okay? Think about that. So it's not uh, sometimes really you want a, a encouragement. You can look at PCA, PLSDA, but uh, really you need to be cautious about that. <laughs> and you can see here is that PCA, um, PLSDA, uh, apply before and after. You can see a better separation. So if you have certain separation, uh, uh, apply PSD. Actually, I try to tease out the signal and make it easy to find out which one actually contributes to separation and make it uh, um, easy to generate hypothesis. Okay, uh, but if you have no separation at all, and uh, you should be more cautious. So PSD can improve PCA, no problem. Um, but uh, uh, if there's no actual separation. PLSD can still do it, which is overfit. So you, you really, uh, PLSD and PCA always use uh, mm, together. Let's see. Just a quick question. So if you look at the upper two, I guess my question has always been, how much is modest separation versus no separation whatsoever? So if you look at the upper PCA, yeah. do you consider that to be no separation? Or do you consider that to it's be hard to see. <laughs> the problem is you can see some separation. And uh, there's actually there's some separation, and uh, if you see the use different normalization stuff, you can see some separation. I know which data it is. It's just separation. It's from clinical sample, so uh, separation is not good. And uh, but there's some separation. On the other hand, the PSDA in the few, in an, in in I'm probably going to discuss is that there's going to some validation. You, you, if you if you just do PSDA, you do a permutation, see the how good the separation is going to be. It's still going to help you prevent some jump to that. There's some good signals. So uh, for the PCA in this uh, top left, I, I, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> yeah. So PLSDA is a partial least square regression. So somehow uh, the, uh, the uh, regression then, oh, uh, questions? No, no, no sorry. No. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what it does internally, why, why I'm saying internal because I write all the code. So, <laughs> so what it converts a class label into numbers and try to perform PSDA regression and between uh, uh, different numerical values. So, and it's susceptible to overfitting by produce uh, patterns of separate even there is no, uh, uh, no real signal. So need to perform cross validation, need to do the permutation. Okay, cross validation permutation. We we are going to discuss more on this concept later. So overfitting, this is very, very important. Just don't na naively believe there's an advanced method that will magically help you solve your problem. Because a lot of the things more advanced is more likely to overfit and uh, please you. And uh, so what is overfitting is that this uh, um, figure shows you that here's your uh, data point and you want to um, fit uh, lines here. And uh, and uh, you can see this just right. Uh, it's, it's, uh, um, uh, this is underfitting because this is a, seems to fit a bit, but it didn't really fit nice. It's underfitting, 
and here you try to connect all the dots, it's overfitting. So uh, overfitting is bad, or, or why? Because it, there's some, in the population, there's some variation just like this. Uh, it's called noise variation, but the overall truth, the pattern is actually this is the truth, and you fit. But if you really start fitting the signal, and it became more noise and prone to uh, a lot of errors, so it, it, it became a bad model. Also, you can see this curve, a lot of, in order to generate a curve, you have need to estimate a lot of parameters. So this parameter is very sample, uh, sample specific, okay? This one only have two parameters. It's probably one or two parameters. So this one became very unrealistic, and it's probably not generalized. You use this model, you get a new patient, and you're doing diagnosis, probably t totally wrong. And this one probably uh, working well. And this one uh, probably working somehow, but it's not as good as that one. So overfitting is really, um, so, yeah? Do you usually produce indicators in order to evaluate the fitness, the goodness of fit, and to determine whether you are overfitting or not? Because when you do PLS, you have uh, root mean square of error prediction, of validation, of cross validation, and from these you can determine whether you are overfitting or not. Yeah. For PLSDA, do you produce the same indicators? Yeah, I think so. We usually the cross validation R square Q square we do calculate. So uh, this is uh, we try to follow the best practice possible, and uh, um, so because the metavalence they use is really um, targeting is not a computer scientist, not a statistician, it's a regular bench scientist. So. Uh, they need to be user friendly. They also prevent certain errors. So it's uh, also workshop. I want to spread some cautions and don't just uh, uh, try to jump to conclusion. So cross validation. How do you do that? Cross validation is that uh, you train your models using a part of data and try to predict the other part. You haven't used it, right? Here is that uh, we have threefold cross validation. We put out data like uh, uh, thirty samples, ten, ten, ten. Okay. We try to be balanced like. Uh, Every every ten we have five control five diseases. We if we can do a balanced uh, subsampling, then you use this chain predict this and uh, calculate its uh, performance. Use this to chain and compute this and doing this. Then average their performance. How many times making wrong? What's the uh, R square Q square? And uh, we can have a good feeling about how good it is, right? And sometimes people want to do more granular unfold cross validation. You can see uh, you have 100 samples, you have 99, uh, change your model and predict one and do it for each sample. And this is probably more, uh, uh, more reproducible, what I'm saying, because you, you guarantee that you're going to go through each sample at least once. And going here is that how do you divide people uh, samples into three folds? And every time a random draw 10, 10, 10, and it's not a guaranteed. So if you're doing cross validation, different try probably have slightly different result. But leave one out cross validation, guaranteed reproducible because every sample need to go through it. Okay? The only uh, the only thing that I leave one out is that um, it's more computing, uh, computationally intensive. You can see that. And if you have a large sample, actually became not matter three fold or five fold or it's just all the same because a large sample. When you go to like say, 500 samples, it's really saturating. You 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 get the whole two parameters. It's a, uh, it's very stable. And you from 500 to 1,000, no change. From 1,000 to 2,000, no change. It's it's uh, it's just between like uh, 10 samples, 20 samples. That you're going to see a lot of fluctuation because you don't have enough samples to estimate the parameters. <coughs> So uh, PSDA model, uh, component and features. So uh, uh, what's the evalu performance evaluation? Is that uh, um, some of the squares captured by the model is R square, cross value is R square, the Q square, and prediction accuracy. So this is a, if you are really a traditional statistician, and this is really the values they, uh, they are looking for, and the review is going to, what is this value? So it's, 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 uh, um, it's all provided, so I'm not going into too much details because this is all the same thing uh, regarding your prediction. And also keep in mind, POS is try to do a regression first and convert to a classification. And uh, permutation test. And so uh, again, uh, like uh, empirical p-values, and uh, the same concept. 
uh, because PLSD is very susceptible to overfitting, basically he's going to uh, try to please you disregarding what your data it is. So let's see how he can trick you. So let's assume there's no separations. We just randomly shuffle your class label and let PLSD to do that to do that uh, classification. And uh, in this case, we are not a visual judge. We just uh, compare their R square, Q square, or, or, or the prediction accuracy and see. How are they able to do that? So this is one actually con con um, computed from the uh, same data. And he just asked about, uh, uh, is that a real separation or not? So actually, it seems to be robust. And you're doing some permutations. And uh, even the data seems uh, like here. Uh, here, it seems uh, not. Uh, why they separated and going here? Is that real or not? And uh, and then you're doing a permutation and uh, see how good is the separation uh, using this original label label versus random permutative label. You can see even if you try to please you use a random label. It the separation is narrow. It's still separate, but it's narrow. So the one you separate the distance uh, that. Uh, mm, Separated here, actually, still further away. So definitely, there's something here that uh, signals and being captured. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, is this an alternative to uh, cross-validation or? Not alternative. It's compli uh, complementary. So you need to both sh show that PLSDA, the cross-validation, and show the permutation. Uh, I because. Uh, for a lot of other methods, like SVM or random forest, usually just one should be fine. Uh, Sometimes I also do the permutation. I found this unnecessary because the, the, these two methods are much less susceptible to overfitting. Cross-validation working fine or not really indi indicate its performance, but PLSD is not. So PLSD is so heavily abused, what I'm saying. So you need to have a double, um, double check. Okay. So PSDA, uh, the other one, so VIP score is a ver uh, variable importance in projection. So this is similar to the <coughs> loading. Okay, you can use the loading, but a lot of the people want to use this VIP. This is okay. So uh, it's just different formula, and the same that captures more information. It's a weighted sum of squared correlation between the PSDA component and the original variable. And so it's captured more, and the weights corresponding to the percentage variation explained by the PLSD components of the model. So uh, <clears throat> a lot of people want to see what's the cutoff. So if you see the literature, most people use one uh, as a, uh, important, but uh, it's, it's really, and sometimes if you see the ranking of the uh, uh, VIP scores, and really there's an, a nice separation. And at a certain point, you see it's a, a separated, for example, here. Um, uh, you can see that this group actually very uh, there, and this we can this one or two, so you don't actually list uh, group is enough, and uh, some time you you don't even need to use a point to one one or more than one. You can see this one it's more uh, clearly uh, there. So when you see the <coughs> VIP is this, uh, yeah. Then subsequently go back and remove the, uh, the variables that have the low VIP score. Does that generally improve your overall uh, PCA modeling or PWSD modeling? Or um, if you if you reduce the number of variables, so you're not are you less prone to overfitting at that point, or does it not really make a difference? So uh, you <coughs> you mentioned that actually his his question is that if uh, if he go back to the PSD model. Remove these uh, uh, variables that's uh, uh, ranked very low, right? It seems not informative. It, will it improve the model? Of course, you are going to improve the model. Um, but it is uh, unethical to do this because you already see the overall result, right? And you go back, remove the things that's not perform well, and you re retrain it. The, the performance value is going to be in, like uh, before, let's say, 85. You're going to become like 86, 87. You're going to gradually improve it. Because the model building is actually try to their best to estimate the signals or stuff. Once you see the whole big, big pictures and you re feeding back, 
and you're definitely going to improve it. But is this model going to be more, is actually better? Probably not, because you, are over, you tend to increase your model fit to your particular data. So you, you make your model more likely to be overfit. So it's more likely to be overfit. And because in clinical medicine, you would routinely do backward, backward stepwise regression, where you, where you would start with all of the things that had a, yeah. some significance yeah. and, routine, and routinely work yeah. out the variables that are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so it's, in that setting, it's quite common to do that. Yeah. It, 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 it's, uh, what I'm seeing unethical is that once you see all the data and you rank use a VIP or use t test, like even just use t test, and you remove the uh, variables with uh, high p values, and then build the model. You already uh, um, kind of violate certain things. It's basically you you know the result. You already use a y label because how the p value is being calculated in the t test. Or how the VIP is calculated. They already use the X and the Y. They know this one is less associated with the patient, uh, with your class labels. So once you attach that, you 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 already uh, um, use the information. Uh, at um, so the 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 whole point is that uh, the only thing that uh, so you probably have a more predictive model, which is all fine. But you need to validate on a new set of patients. You never use to. Once you're doing that, it's all fine. I, I don't care about it. It's just that you use the current data and remove the uninformative variables based on current data, and you tell the review, I'm 99% right in this one, which is not true. Even your model is probably best, but in reality, you have model performance in 85, not 99. Why is 99? Because you constantly manually trimming these uh, uh, uninformative variables. The model itself is correct. What I'm saying is most li likely that what you have done, the model itself is correct, but the performance reported is not right. It's over-optimistic. It's not 99. It's 85, right? So if you validate your model, even after whatever your manual trimming, and on a new patient cohort, and that cohort never used to generate your current model, and you report this is performance, it's all fine. So disregarding your previous one. So the, what I'm saying, the, the, all the key features, all the weight, all the parameters, probably all right. It's just performance value is over-optimistic. And you make it more likely from the regular plus one to the nature of biotech because the 99% seems amazing. But it's not in reality, just because you evaluate it on the same data. Right? Just this number is over-optimistic. I get some of what you're saying. Let me, let me pick your brain in the lineup session about it because uh... It seems like at, at odds to the way we do multivariable regression in clinical medicine, um, and in terms of what makes overfitting versus not. But let's let's talk about it. In the lab. So <laughs> okay, no problem. Yeah. The, uh, the, the slide before that why do you mention that it might be a good candidate for exclusive DNA? Yeah, I think this is somehow addressing what he he said. It's a uh, as uh, so. Uh, the model building and the biomarker things is a different thing. Biomarker, uh, what we are talking about, the exploratory statistical analysis. Biomarkers need an iterative, okay? This model building is, uh, if we talk about that, you really need a new cohort, okay? Yeah. And uh, when I need to stop, I'm just not quite sure. Thank you, Nico. Okay. So assessing classification model performance. <clears throat> so uh, I think it is intuitive if your data is very balanced. So half and half, less easy. So accuracy is uh, all, whatever you've done is uh, correct out of the total prediction. So uh, you have 12, uh, 13 samples out of you try to predict. And the night time is correct, so 69% accurate. <clears throat> the other commonly used is uh, error rate, so Y minus accuracy, so 13.1%. So it's all this, so I'm saying it's because it's used in the metabolist for different uh, approaches. So you need to uh, switch back and forth what he's talking about and how to convert them. But uh, unfortunately, <coughs> in clinical data, it's uh, a lot of the imbalanced. So uh, HIV, so you have five cases in 1,000 samples, or in 1,000 people. So if you predict every everyone is healthy, and you have 99.5%. And so it's uh, 
majority vote, it seems very easy and it seems a cool performance, but it's not right. It's not useful. It's not a, it's just uh, so there's a biomarkers, uh, screening biomarkers, and um, like diagnostic biomarkers. A lot of things is you need to really have a different purpose. How do we try to balance them? And uh, uh, of course, there's uh, for clinical, they have very strict uh, things, and over the years, and I think uh, sensitivity specificity became more and more uh, prevalent and uh, used. So, uh, uh, true positive, true negative, false positive, false negative, sensitivity specificity. So, this is all different measurement. And uh, just uh, you need to develop uh, a, <coughs> a feelings about uh, what they are. Sensitivity is the uh, true positive rate. So whatever you see, uh, what's the uh, in in whatever you see the right, what percentage is right, and specificity, the true negative rate. So uh, whatever you see is the health health is not disease. What percentage is it's actually healthy and non So it's a uh, true positive, true negative, just there. So example is that uh, <clears throat> you have the healthy, true negative on the left side is the true positive on the right side, hand side. And uh, it's, you can see it's not a clear <coughs> separation. So you need to make a decision point. Where is the cutoff? So if that's a cutoff, you can see uh, some regions is, uh, <coughs> uh, it's going to be uh, like this, this region. If you're talking about blue, uh, it's good. this is actually on this side, it's a blue and two, it's positive. You predict the positive, so it's too positive. But this one, it's uh, actually positive, but you predict it negative, so it's going to be false negative, okay? And the same thing are going to be here. So uh, it, it is, uh, you can see, you can move this uh, bar, cutoff threshold, from left to right, from right, left to right. So you can switch uh, how much false positive going to be produced, or how much false negative going to be produced. And uh, because there is no perfect solution, this because it's not, uh, it's overlap. So you have to decide what's the cost. If I'm seeing this false negative, uh, what's the consequence? It's false positive. So this is really depending on clinical questions. If I'm seeing this HIV is positive, we say it's negative. We miss it. It's going to be highly cons probably have a very high consequence. Rather than I said, oh, these people probably healthy, but it's, uh, uh, if we see it's, it could be po positive, let them send them to the next screening. Probably it's more tolerable. So it's really depending on the cost. So you can move this bar uh, back and forth and to decide what's the cutoff. So cutoff is not really a computational thing. <coughs> uh, we can always calculate what's the best cutoff, uh, give the best balance. But the clinical, when you do a real time, uh, a real life application, it's a lot of other things. And uh, how do you make it zero? Uh, one, one tool is called RC curve, called the receiver operating characteristic curve. So it's a, a historical name for reader studies and a very widely used biomedical application. So it can be used for a, a classification performance assessment and compare different biomarker models. So if essentially it is a true positive versus false positive. So this is, a, <coughs> uh, based on that, you can actually move the, uh, choose a, uh, where it's the best. So for example, you have your uh, classifications uh, models and it's use different cutoff at each cutoff point you can see computing is uh, uh, true positive false positive and you draw that because you can see that this is uh, x x is a false positive and the y axis is true positive you can draw these uh, dots and connect them and this will be your RC curve so it's RC curve uh, it's not that straightforward you need to first build a classifier and it need to uh, predict and use a cutoff and calculate as each step. So this is a, a best done is by compute, compute, uh, compute, by compute, not by hand. Okay. So uh, from here you can see you are treating off between sensitivity and specificity. So if you go here, you have a high specificity, but less sensitivity. If you go here, you have a high sensitivity but less specificity. So it's really, um, it's and if you go here, probably you have the uh, balanced. But if, if this is a really computed by the computer. And in reality, you really need to see uh, which part you want to choose. So um, um, here at computation, uh, you, you, you can do that area under the curve. Basically, the, um, 
um, the bigger this value, the more uh, the better the performance. So this is also used if you compare different Bellmark models. And here you can see that uh, if you're perfect, you can basically like this is 100%. But uh, if you're doing 95%, it's pretty good. And uh, uh, and uh, uh, this one's random, so somehow they found it overlap. So if you're random one, it's just random guess. It's basically 15, 15%. It's going to the diagonal. This is uh, around 70%. So usually this is a uh, we see a lot of 75, 17%. So this is quite common. So if you once you start going to 18, 18, 5, and become yeah, more promising. Yeah? So this ROC curve can only be used with classifiers that uh, uses two classes? Yeah, it is defined for only two classes. Can we use it for classifiers that uses multiple classes, or we have to use another technique to validate this, these types of models? No, this ROC curve, you, if you see the... Uh, uh, this is only defined for the sensitivity specificity. So this is only to the yes or no, true or false, binary. So even you could um, whatever multi classifier, you have to uh, multi group classifier will be able to deal with uh, two groups, right? Yeah. So you have to make the as our C curve as whatever you decide. If you have multi groups, you still have to bring into two groups. Okay. Just because it's uh, defined, yes or no, you can. Oh, sorry. So, yeah, it's uh, A, B, C. You have to define a yes or no. Once you're doing that, they can do it. So somehow, how you do that is based on what groups you think is the positive, what group is negative, right? Yeah, it's just defined for these two uh, steps. Okay. So if I have multiple groups, I have to find a way to make it to two groups in order to, if I want to use the arrows. Exactly. This is how it is defined. So if you have multi-groups, you can have, uh, uh, like you have control low or high. You can either being low or high. You have control versus low, control versus high. It's just the reality. This is how it is defined. And uh, you, yeah, uh, you, you can try to do like accuracy, other performance value this use multi-group. But our curve strictly two groups. Yeah. So other two uh, methods. Is uh, other supervised methods uh, commonly used for this um, uh, metabolomics, like same kind of soft independent modeling of class energy? This is a commercial or patented proprietary tool. We're not going to talk too much. If you use same copy and uh, and you read their manual, I'm not uh, uh, a fan of that. So the other one is uh, OPS is uh, orthogonal projection of latent structures. So this is available in uh, MetaManalyst. Also, again, uh, this is based on open source R. And uh, you should try to see orthogonal PRS. Don't see OPRS, because I get some legal notice from company. They don't even want me to mention name. So um, so this is an interesting point. And the other one is uh, SVM random machine, uh, random forest. This is all. Uh, <coughs> Available there, it's just, uh, you just uh, use whatever you want. So it's all good um, model. So let me see. And uh, I, I, I'm not really, uh, basically, SVM random forest, what I'm saying that is really well used, but it's mostly treated as a black box. And uh, what important concept is that uh, I just mentioned about this uh, cross validation importance. Uh, 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 Com variable importance. So once you get this concept, you can actually use it as it is. There's no way uh, I can give you some intuitive explanation on the SVM uh, stuff because it's uh, really, really <laughs> complicated. But on the other hand, is you feel free to explore. And uh, during lab session, you can try to interact with me, see if I can give you some more insight. But the uh, formal uh, introduction of this one is uh, a really um, I don't think it's uh, suitable for this uh, type of audience. But on the other hand, uh, this t this method is so well um, used, and a lot of other materials available. Okay. So uh, uh, for, uh, again, this is re-emphasize what I've mentioned before: is that uh, try uh, unsupervised, simple, like uh, from t-test and over to unsupervised, then move to supervised, and uh, then go to machine learning. Don't go the the other way around, because that uh, uh, first is hard to interpret. 
and probably you're going to overfit your data. If your data working fine with your PC, and really, really, that's probably you just try to develop your hypothesis and try to um, write your manuscript. You don't need to go to very fancy uh, tools to, uh, to to do that. Of course, you can use PSD to further separate the signal, but it's it's uh, it's pretty set already. And uh, uh, let's see, data analysis prog uh, progression is that. Uh, <clears throat> So for our lab and what what we um, um, want to do is if you use a PCA as uh, our clustering which is unsupervised, so it's really based on your uh, natural clustering of your data. Okay, the data label is not being used. It didn't use prior knowledge, so there's no kind of ethical things. If you see the label, you already know the secret. You're going back to change your data. This is all you can use it uh, just uh, safely. Once you go to uh, supervised, it starts using your prior knowledge, you use a class label. And, uh, and it, it, if you see the separation already in the PCA clustering, you use this to improve the signal, to develop and further refine your hypothesis, it's all fine. But if no separation in your PCA or unsupervised, and you see this, uh, uh, suddenly it's a good separation in the supervised, you really need to be more cautious at the moment now. And, uh, <clears throat> Statistical significance is that um, um, uh, supervised method, especially for PSDA, and this can be misleading. So uh, always try to please you. And at this time, if you you should do a permutation for the especially for PSDA, which uh, we metabolists already have it. So um, um, again, we we are not going to iterate this, and so. Um, uh, the, there's no hard rules. I can tell you, you should do this, should not do that. It's just the general guidance, and you just follow. And uh, every time you need to think actively about your data, what you expect, and what surprise, and w w something is too good, and it's usually too good to be true. Okay, this is sometimes you you need to start to think, and uh, you can ask me, and uh, or you can see other publication what their practice. So uh, sometimes you see uh, um, review papers using um, the certain tools. They just really use it in a way that's um, not proper. So it uh, it's, uh, seems uh, you spend so much money and uh, spend so much time and uh, really uh, try to think about it and try to think about the, your data, try to think about the method and the, the marriage of both. It really make a good, uh, enjoyable reading for your um, paper. Oh, this is uh, actually um, early. And the questions and uh, yeah, uh, let's come back to the beginning of our FDR. Uh, yeah. So I, when we do a multiple variable analysis, we put all the variables and try to do the analysis. We use FDR, uh, FDR for sure. But if I do a universal analysis, like uh, no. of the rates, uh, uh, the food intake, or the so separate uh, variables. Using then when we report it, do still do FDR correction or? Uh, um, let me try to rephrase your question. You are talking about uh, false discovery rate uh, yeah. in a multivariate analysis. Yeah, so for you, when you do multivariate analysis, we put all the pieces, right, all the variables and yeah. analyze it, then we definitely need let me yeah. let me correct you first. Uh, let's do. so first is that a false discovery rate design for univariate because we uh, test the individual feature using an uh, using t test or ANOVA one after one one after one like twenty thousand times. This is FDR. When we do a multivariate test, we consider all variables simultaneously. We only test it once. Okay, there's no false discovery rate. There's no multi testing adjustment. So all the features are based on the like based on VIP or loading, it's, it's based on coefficient, co uh, correlation coefficient. It's just the rank and the top, like say top 20 probably significant based on this PCA uh, uh, analysis. There's no false discovery rate because they are not testing. They simply rank based on the, uh, co uh, the, the weight. So I was sometime when I use it, just, just so we have a bunch of all the things in there, and like also this, this kind of uh, similar to the F I was kind of thinking that if, if we 
I just choose the only group voice to summarize it, then choose yeah. only one, like uh, another outline, and when I report like five of them, and do I still have to do it? FDR correction, that, that, that's sometimes I do. Yeah, I'm, I'm not quite aware of that. Uh, FDR de design for PCS stuff. It's it's kind of new to me. So uh, unless uh, you show me the paper and like I can see it, but uh, uh, I, I that's just the theoretical, not applicable. Yeah. So, yeah. For the evaluation of the classification model, you're saying that we have to use either permutation or cross validation. Are they both equally effective in this, or are there any scenarios where you have to use cross validation and other ones that you have? No, cross-validation is more commonly used for machine learning. Uh, permutation test is just a recent years, it start uh, uh, more widely used. It's, um, it's they are testing different things. So, so uh, uh, let's, let me try to say it. So cross-validation is tell you how good is your model works, like say 95%. Um, uh, it's, that's basically, it's based on 19 times out of 100 times, probably good. And the permutation test is actually give you a p-value. And if p-value is significant, it means there's some signals in your model. Actually, it's not random. Okay? It's just uh, they're not going to tell you how good is your model. It just say, says there's some signal in your model. Right? It's different from random. So they are very complementary. They are not mm, talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm.